My name is Dr. Amy Iverson and my consultancy, Hope Consulting, have been involved in the training, running and evaluation of the Academy of Medical Sciences Mentoring Scheme since 2010. Today in this short video, I'm going to tell you about the 10 things that academic colleagues most often ask me about mentoring, to give you an overview of the area and hopefully to answer any questions that you might have. Now the first thing that I'm always asked, particularly by academics, is what's the evidence base for mentoring anyway? And it's an important question because we mustn't assume that mentoring is beneficial. The reality is that although mentoring is an intervention with very high face validity, there's precious little high quality evidence to support its use. A systematic review performed in 2006 and published in JAMA examined the evidence for the use of mentoring in academic medicine. The review collected 137 papers together, but was only able to report on 42 of these, with others being excluded because of poor quality. The vast majority of the studies included in the review were cross-sectional studies, and there were no randomised controlled trials. With that caveat in place, the authors were able to report that mentoring was, based on subjective report at least, associated with enhanced personal development, a sense of greater career guidance, and improvements in research productivity, including grants and papers. The number of papers published on mentoring has mushroomed over the last few years, and we have to hope that in this vast new body of published data, there will be some high quality studies and particularly some randomized controlled trials. Though mentoring has high face validity, it's dangerous to assume that it's helpful and useful. The research base is clear on this. Mentoring relationships without a clear contract between mentor and mentee are really unlikely to work. I liken this to the dynamics of a dance. You're much more likely to make it around the floor if you both know the steps. Conversely, if neither of you know the dance, it's highly unlikely that you're going to succeed. It's important, therefore, to clarify basics with each other, such as, for example, how often will you meet? How long will you meet for? And who will be responsible for setting up the sessions? It's especially important that in a first meeting, you explore things like, what are the limits of confidentiality? Will notes be kept? And what about if a mentor finds themselves on a peer review panel or interview panel? Finally, it's important in the first session to have some discussion about what your shared understanding of mentoring is. I suggest that meetings are regular rather than as required and I think this is particularly important on the Academy of Medical Sciences mentoring scheme where there is a big hierarchical gap between mentor and mentee as it's unlikely that a mentee will request a session even when times are tough for fear that they may be taking up the mentor's time. We suggest on the Academy scheme that you aim to meet between four and six times a year. The meeting should last at least an hour because if they last less time than this, it's unlikely that you will get into the issue in enough depth and breadth in order to help the mentee. The mentee is responsible for setting the meetings, for preparing for them, and ahead of the meeting, I suggest to mentees that they prepare a short summary of what they want to get out of the session and email it to their mentor at least 24 hours in advance. Ideally, the session should happen on some neutral ground, although I understand that this is not always possible. The mentee sets the agenda and the focus of the session is not on the provision of advice or solutions or gifts of opportunity, but rather on building the mentee's problem-solving, self-efficacy skills and exploring solutions. Afterwards, I suggest that the mentee prepares a very short summary which simply details a. the main issues discussed, b. the key discoveries or learning points, and c. the agreed actions. The fourth thing that I'm often asked by mentors in a first session, how do I bring my mentee out of their shell? Reasonable objectives for a first meeting are to establish rapport, and this can be achieved by discussing areas of common ground, shared experiences and shared values. It's also important to discuss expectations and ground rules. Finally, in a first session, you can begin to ask the mentee for their thoughts on their personal objectives for the mentoring relationship 
and to begin to establish some longer term objectives and milestones. You may agree some actions at this point for the next period until the next meeting. And remember, it's this agreement of actions that differentiates mentoring from a cosy chat. I would suggest that it's quite helpful to have a bit of a skeleton upon which to hang some of the content of the session. There are various mnemonics which you may have heard of which help people to think about structuring a mentoring session. The most well known of these is John Whitmore's GROW model. Today I'm going to teach you the OSCAR model, which I think is a slightly more evolved version of GROW. OSCAR starts with the O, which stands for outcomes, and this is where you help the mentee to clarify the outcomes they want to achieve. You might ask them, for example, what would you like to achieve from today's session? Or, when you walk away from today's session, what will have changed in order for it to have been worthwhile? The S of Oscar is situation, and this is where you get clarity around what's happening right now for the mentee. What's the current situation? What's actually happening? The C of Oscar is choices and consequences, and this is where you help the mentee to generate as many alternative choices as possible and raise awareness about the consequences of each possible choice. So, for example, you might ask, what choices do you have? What options can you choose from? And what are the consequences of each choice? The A of Oscar is action, and this is where you help the mentee to clarify the next steps and take responsibility for their personal action plan. You might ask, what actions will you take? When will you take these actions? And on a scale of 0 to 10, how likely are you to take these actions now? Finally, the R of Oscar is review, and this step creates an ongoing process of review and evaluation where you help the mentee to continually check that they're on course. You might ask, what steps will you take to review your progress? When will we get together to review your progress? And how can I help? I believe that one of the key things about mentoring is to foster some between session work. And I do as many things as I can to try and extend the reflection between the mentee's sessions. I do this in two or three ways. First, I always insist that the mentee prepares a very short summary of the session, as I've detailed previously, within 72 hours of the session close. I then reply to that summary with my own reflection on their comments and any additional comments that I wish to make. I might at this point throw in a few additional questions. Finally, I sometimes send something for the mentee to read, which might extend or deepen their reflection a paper, a chapter, a review, a book, or even a poem. Well, it's a very common complaint. We know that having the right chemistry is a really, really important facet of a successful mentoring relationship. It's something about compatibility, or being on the same wavelength, which is as essential to the mentoring relationship as it is to other successful dynamic and reciprocal relationships. We know from the literature that successful mentoring relationships are characterised by reciprocity, mutual respect, a sense of similar expectations, a personal connection and shared values. Unsuccessful relationships are characterised by poor communication, lack of commitment, personality differences, perceived or real competition, conflicts of interest, and the mentor's lack of experience and training. Chemistry problems are probably the single most important reason why mentoring relationships fail. You have to make sure that you are clear on the Academy's policy, which is of a no-blame divorce, and ensure that this is explicitly addressed at the first meeting. My advice is that if the relationship is not working, have the courage to call it. Rematches are often very successful. We think that training is really important. The evidence suggests that mentoring relationships where neither mentor nor mentee are trained 
90% of them will fail. If you train mentors and not mentees, around 50% of the relationships will last. Finally, if you train both mentors and mentees, 90% of them are likely to succeed. This is because these relationships begin with a clear sense of shared purpose and direction. The Academy runs several Mentoring Skills Masterclasses over the course of each year, and whether you're a mentor or a mentee, we would encourage you to come along to one of these, if you're able. Number nine lets you know that we have a wealth of resources that you can access by logging on to the Academy of Medical Sciences website and going to their mentoring pages. I hope what I've demonstrated in this short video is that the Academy of Medical Sciences scheme espouses a model of developmental mentoring, which is fundamentally different from older style patronage or sponsorship, the sort of mentoring that many of us will have received in the past. If you feel like this video has piqued your interest in learning about new ways of mentoring, do come along to some of our training or contact us at mentoring at agmedsci.ac.uk. Thank you.